Hello doctors welcome back to Pilots of Medicine so today in today's video we are going to start from the question that we left in the last video of the biochemistry base series in the part 1 and this is the part 2 so before we start I would like to suggest you to please subscribe to the channel and if you found the last few videos very helpful please consider sharing these videos with your friends so that the uh, doctors who are going to give croc this year uh, can get benefit from these videos as well as the channel can have some benefit as well so without any further delay let's begin so the 11th question is that a mother consulted a doctor about her five-year-old child who develops rhythmas vesicular rash and skin itch under the influence of sun the laboratory studies revealed decreased iron concentration in the blood serum increased uroporphinogen 1 excretion with the urine they are asking what inherited pathology is apparent in this child so the thing to notice here is the clinical symptoms of vesicular rash and skin itch under the influence of sun and also they have given a substrate that is being accumulated in the body and finally being excreted in the urine that is uroporphyrinogen 1 to understand this topic we need to go back to the biochemistry of heme synthesis so heme you know heme is a part of the hemoglobin compound that is present in our white uh, red blood cells erythrocytes so let's talk about how heme is synthesized and apparently the disorders that are related to heme synthesis so first of all the substrates or the or the elements that combine to form the heme molecule first of all the ba basic substrates are succinyl coenzyme a and glycine in the mitochondria of the cell these two combine with the help of the enzyme ala synthase to form amino levulonic acid this is the first and the rate limiting step of this reaction and this is the enzyme that has the most uh, like influence most regulated by various hormones and by the feedback mechanism as well so amino levulonic acid uh, hence formed is converted into PBG or porphyrinogen with the help of enzyme AHLA dehydratase. Now this enzyme is very sensitive to lead. So in case of lead poisoning this enzyme is impaired and hence the heme synthesis is stopped at this stage and there is increased amount of amino levulonic acid in the body. And if heme synthesis is impaired the patient has hypoxia because of decreased heme hemoglobin in the blood and all the other symptoms related to hypoxia so then after synthesis of porphobilinogen the next step is with the help of uroporphinogen 1 synthase and by the name you can guess that the next compound to be synthesized is uroporphinogen 1 now the enzyme uroporphinogen 1 synthase if deficient or impaired then the condition that arises is acute intermittent porphyrias now porphyrias are the specific disorders of heme synthesis the, with the symptoms like photophobia and one very interesting symptom which is red urine excretion because of the presence of porphyric intermediates in the urine so first porphyria that we know is acute intermittent porphyria it is due to deficiency of uroporphinogen 1 synthase and in this case if this enzyme is impaired or deficient the substance that will get accumulated is porphobilinogen so when you are learning about porphyrias you need to remember three things first of all obviously the name of the porphyria then you need to remember what enzyme is deficient or impaired in the porphyria and the next thing you need to remember is what substance will get accumulated which is always the substrate before the reaction so next uroporphinogen 1 is converted into uroporphinogen 3 with the help of uroporphinogen 3 synthase and this kind of porphyria which is due to deficiency of uroporphinogen 3 synthase is congenital erythropoietic porphyria so in this case the substance that will be accumulated or in excess will be uroporphinogen 1 so that completes the two porphyrias next the third type of porphyria is porphyria cunitia tata the hence formed uroporphinogen 3 is converted by decarboxylation by uroporphinogen decarboxylate into a substance known as coproporphinogen 3 
now if this enzyme uroporphenogen decarboxylase is impaired then the uh, porphyria is called porphyria cutanea tarda and obviously the substrate will be accumulated which will be uroporphenogen 3 you need to remember the names of the porphyria the related enzyme and henceforth the substance that will be accumulated in this case now the heme synthesis is continued and then protofirins are formed and there are also some disorders of pro, uh, protofirin enzymes which are known as protofiria but we won't get deep into that um, that hole and we would like to continue with the main porphyrias and finish the heme synthesis here so por- protofirin 9 is the final por- protofirin form with the help of the enzyme ferrocalitase ferrocalitase combines with uh, combines an ferrous molecule fe2 plus molecule with the protofirin 9 and finally heme is formed after a series of reactions now ferrocalitase is also an enzyme which is very sensitive to lead poisoning so similarly to ala dehydratase if there is increased quantity of lead in the blood then these enzymes will be impaired and heme synthesis will be impaired causing hypoxic symptoms now heme formed has a negative feedback uh, which uh, inhibits ala synthase and causes inhibition of heme synthesis similarly glucose has a negative effect on ala synthesis but some molecules like alcohol barbiturates barbiturates and hypoxia has stimulatory effect causing increased heme synthesis so in the question there was increased concentration of uroporphenogen 1 so in that case if uroporphenogen 1 is increased it has to be congenital erythropoietic porphyria and uroporphenogen 3 synthase is the enzyme being impaired over here so i think that is a simple way to finish this topic so let's go to the next one without any further delay so 12th question guys that a 3 year old child with fever was given aspirin it resulted in intensified erythrocyte hemolysis Hemolytic anemia might have been caused by congenital insufficiency of the following enzyme. So causes of hemolysis can be divided into extravascular and intravascular. In extravascular causes, you can further divide them into causes that are extrinsic to the red blood cell and inside the red blood cell itself. So if the causes are extravascular and also they are extrinsic to the red blood cells, then these are immune mediated so warm anti uh, autoimmune uh, aiha cold aiha or autoimmune itself so these are immune mediated mechanisms then we have the intrinsic factors intrinsic to the rbcs first of all the most important is the rbc membrane abnormalities so imagine if the rbc's membrane is like weak or structurally uh, structurally abnormal then the rbc can get destroyed very easily so for example there's a condition called as hereditary spirocytosis the rbc has like this abnormal shape of a spherical shape so in this case the rbc's membrane is abnormal similarly there is a elliptical like shape of hereditary elliptocytosis and in this case also RBC's membrane is very abnormal. Then we have the intrinsic cause which is hemoglobin abnormalities. They, it can be sickle cell anemia, it can be thalassemia, it can be unstable hemoglobin. These are the hemoglobin abnormality, abnormalities with structural changes in the chains with alpha and beta chains or, or the or chains of the hemoglobin molecule. So if those chains are structurally impaired then hemoglobin will be impaired or abnormal causing again hemolysis. Third the most important and relevant to our question is enzyme defects. First enzyme deficient deficiency is the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency which can cause hemolysis. Pyruvate kinase deficiency can also cause hemolysis. Glutathione peroxidase deficiency is also a cause of hemolysis in RBCs. So if these three enzymes are deficient, the RBC is very prone to getting hemolyzed. So even slight 
uh, stress for example by aspirin can cause a hemolysis of the rbcs releasing its content into the blood now intravascular causes can be infections causing hemolysis like malaria and clostridium perfringens it can be complement mediated uh, hemolysis it can also be mechanical shearing mechanical shearing is a uh, destruction of rbcs with the help of uh, like some prostatic heart walls or some malformation in the uh, av node like av malformation malformation etc so these are the main hemolytic causes which can cause hemolysis in the body so i think that covers the question they are asking about the enzyme deficiency the only enzyme that is that can cause hemolytic anemia here is g6pdh or glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase need to remember these intrinsic rbcs causes the most okay so let's go to the next one the blood of a 12 year old boy presents low concentration of uric acid and accumulation of xanthin and hypoxanthin this child has a genetic defect of the following molecule so this question is about purine degradation you know there are two types of uh, nucleic bases there are purines and there are pyrimidines so purines are adenine and guanine and pyrimidines are cytosine thymidine and uracil so when the uh, purine nucleotides nucleotides means that when purine nucleic base gets combined with ribose sugar and phosphate group uh, it forms purine nucleotide so in that case the degradation of those uh, those molecules nucleotides formed finally forms ure uric acid or urate so degradation of purine molecules the end product form is urate but let's talk about the intermediate products so guanosine or gmp guanosine monophosphate they interconvert and finally they form xanthine from here inosine monophosphate is an intermediate product of this degradation adenosine or amp they form imp and uh, adenosine forms inosine then the next product form here is hypoxanthine hypoxanthine gets converted into xanthine with the help of xanthine oxidase this enzyme is very important again xanthine is converted into uric acid with the help of xanthine oxidase this enzyme this enzyme takes oxygen and water gives out uh, hydrogen peroxide and this enzyme is responsible for the whole purine degradation so if in this case there is accumulation of xanthine and hypoxanthine then if the substrate is being accumulated there must be a problem with the enzyme and the finally uric acid will not be formed so this is purine degradation at its simplest i hope you understood it the gist of it is that the final product form after purine degradation is urate or uric acid and the intermediate products hypoxanthine and xanthine they are converted into uric acid or urate with the help of the enzyme xanthine oxidase so i hope that clears it uh, let's go to the next one okay so increased amount of free fat acids is absorbed in the blood of the patient with diabetes mellitus it can be caused by the which we have to need found so before that let's talk a little about fat metabolism you know in the intestines fat is absorbed chylomicrons are formed and these chylomicrons they go to the liver liver takes these things back and they enter the adipose tissue which is the storage site of these fats fatty acids are converted into storage from triacylglycerol tri and stored there now when you need these um, these fatty acids for like say energy production or say phospholipid synthesis these need to come back from the adipose tissue this process is known as mobilization of fat now this mobilization of fat is uh, is done with the help of an, an enzyme called as hormone sensitive triglyceride lipase why is this hormone sensitive we'll talk about that in a few seconds so here you can see the triacylglycerol which is stored in the adipose tissue this enzyme acts on this and it gives out free fatty acids and diacylglycerol this diacylglycerol 
gets converted into monoacylglycerol with an enzyme called as diacylglycerol lipase and then monoacylglycerol lipase converts it into finally glycerol so glycerol and three fatty acids are released after a tag molecule is um, is is converted into glycerol and fatty acids so this enzyme hormone sensitive T TG lipase is activated by hormones like epinephrine norepinephrine glucagon thyroxine glucocorticoids thyroid stimulating hormone adenocortic uh, uh, adenocortic uh, hormone and growth hormone so these hormones ACTH GH TSH and everything else they stimulate adenylate cyclase this adenylate cyclase converts ATP into cyclic AMP this cyclic AMP has a stimulatory effect on the protein kinase this protein kinase activates the inactive TG lipase into an active form and thus the triacylglycerols are converted into diacylglycerols and they are released into the blood similarly insulin niacin and prostaglandin E1 has a negative effect causing decrease in cyclic AMP levels causing decrease in activity of protein kinase and hence fat is stored and not released into the body so this is how the thing is the mobilization of fat occurs so in the question they ask that there is increased amount of free fat acids so if there is increased amount of free fat acids the storage of the triacylglycerols must be decreased and the stored must be released into the blood which is due to increased activity of triglyceride lipase adipocytes. I think that clears it. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so the 15th question is that a per female patient of 46 year old has a continuous history of progressive muscular Duchenne's dystrophy. They are asking what enzyme can be of diagnostic value. So Duchenne dystrophy is related to a protein called as dystrophin. This protein is very important for the structural stability of a muscle fiber. Okay, so this disease, muscular dystrophy of Duchenne, is caused by a mutation in the gene encoding dystrophin. So this protein is not formed. It is, it is an X-linked recessive disorder. So mostly it is manifested in males. So what are the symptoms? Symptoms can be weakness in the onset of legs, hyperlordosis, hypertrophy of weak muscles, progressive course over time, there is absence of bladder or bowel dysfunction or bowel dysfunction, absence of bladder function, sensory disturbance, febrile illness. The gist of it is, is that as the person grows, there occurs many symptoms that can be seen as muscular dystrophy being occurring. The patient is not able to move properly at the age of 8 years, there is weakness. By the age of 15 years, the patient is seen with low doses of scoliosis and in a wheelchair, cannot move at all, se severe crippling deformities. So this is seen and all other symptoms are seen with age. So this is due to dystrophy in protein being impaired or not present at all. So what happens in any muscular disease is that there are certain enzymes that are present in the muscles. So if there is a disorder that leads to destruction of muscles, those enzymes, they get released into the blood. One such enzyme is serum creatinine phosphokinase. In Duchenne's dystrophy, this enzyme is always increased, almost 50 to 100 times more than normal patients. So from birth, this enzyme is mostly increased and can be used as diagnostic a feature or characteristic of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So I think that clears this topic. The essence of creatinine phosphokinase can be understood in this way. So let's go to the next one. Sixteenth question is that a patient is ill with diabetes mellitus that is accompanied by hyperglycemia of over 7.2 millimol millimole per liter on an empty stomach. The level of what blood plasma protein allows to estimate glycemia rate res retrospectively like 4 to 8 weeks this specified. So before that I would like to give you small trivia. Whenever you find a value given as 7.2 millimole per liter, if you want to convert into, basically if you want to convert millimole per liter into 
milligram per deciliter which is another SI unit you can multiply it by 1 upon 0 0.055 if you multiply 7.2 by 1 upon 0 0.055 you will get the this value in milligram per deciliter anyway back to the question so there are uh, for diabetes uh, estimation that the patient a diabetic patient is control has controlled glucose or not there occur some long-term biochemical indices we know about regular blood sugar tests and even glucose tolerance test but there occurs there have we have some long-term biochemical indices of diabetic control what do these long-term uh, indices mean that there are some proteins or some molecules in the body which can combine with glucose and they remain in the body for that period of time and from estimating their quantity in the body we can estimate that about a few days ago or a few weeks ago how much glucose these are did our patient had in our body did a patient have in our, their body so one such molecule the most important and the most used is glycated or glycated or glycosate glycosylated hemoglobin let's talk about it so glycos glycosylated hemoglobin is formed when the patient's hemoglobin is exposed to glucose if rbc is, is exposed to a hyperglycemic or high quantity of glucose then glycated hemoglobin is formed it can be named as hba1c so it is directly related to rbc's exposure to glucose so in normal patient the this value is about 3 to 5 percent but in diabetics it is elevated as high as 15 percent so this value is very important because as hemoglobin or as rbc has in life for about 120 days so glycated hemoglobin can be used to reflect blood glucose level over two months or about uh, four to eight weeks prior to its measurement Another molecule we can use is fructosamine. It can measure or indicate the average level of blood glucose for the past two, three weeks. Another is glycated albumin, which indicates glucose over three, work, three weeks prior to the determination. So these are some long-term biochemical indices. So in the question, they ask for about four to eight weeks. So the answer is not albumin because it's just three weeks and glycated hemoglobin because it helps over to indicate blood glucose level over two months prior to the measurement time correct so let's go to the next one so in a case of enterobiasis archaean the structural analog of vitamin b2 is administered the synthesis disorder of which enzyme does this medicine cause so vitamin b2 is riboflavin Riboflavin's coenzymic form is flavin-dependent uh, flavin uh, mononucleotide and dinucleotide. This is flavin, in, flavin adenine dinucleotide and flavin mononucleotide. So these are the coenzymic forms. They take part in redox reactions and they are known as flavin-dependent dehy dehydrogenases, the enzymes which have these as the coenzyme. So, as riboflavin's coenzymic form is FAD and FMN, then the enzymes that they act as a coenzyme are FAD-dependent dehydrogenases, and this must be impaired in this case. Simple? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so in this case, a 10-year-old child experiences acute respiratory infections with multiple spotty hemorrhages in the place of clothes friction. This is important. In the places of clothes friction, there are hemorrhages. Hypovitaminesis of what vitamin is present? This is a Dirzen disease called a scurvy, which is due to deficiency of vitamin C in the diet or in the body. Vitamin C, as we know, is ascorbic acid. The human body cannot synthesize vitamin C on its own. Therefore, it needs to depend on exogenous dietary sources for meeting the vitamin needs of the body. Now, the symptoms of or clinical manifestation of scurvy can be divided into four H's. Four, you can remember it by four H. So, these four H's are hemorrhage, hyperkeratosis, 
hypochondriasis and hematologic abnormalities now a plasma plasma level if we talk about a fasting serum ascorbic acid is greater than 0.6 if it is less than 0.2 it means it's deficient but scurvy is uh, diagnosed if the level of vitamin c is less than 0.1 mg per deciliter so these symptoms respiratory infection because um, vitamin c has a role to play in immunity and also multiple spotty hemorrhages in place of close friction is correct characteristic symptom of vitamin c deficiency and hence the answer here is vitamin c deficiency we'll talk more talk about functions of vitamin c in the next question don't worry about it so let's go to the next question without any further delay uh, these are the symptoms you can see of vitamin c deficiency you'll know why these symptoms occur when we finish the next question so in this question they have said that hydroxylation of endogenous substrates and xenobiotics requires a donor of protons they are asking which of the following vitamins can play this role so the answer is obviously vitamin c so we are going to talk about it so when we are going to talk about the main function of vitamin c so first most important fu- uh, function that you need to remember is that vitamin c plays a role in collagen synthesis it acts as a cofactor during hydroxylation of proline and lysine proline and lysine are the important amino acids that form collagen and hydroxylation of these amino acids forms hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine and these are involved in collagen synthesis so vitamin c plays an important role in this next it acts as a proton donor during microsomal oxidation of xenobiotics and endogenous substances so proton donor then it is an antioxidant we have all heard about it in all the vitamin c juices ads and everything correct also vitamin c has an important anti atherosclerotic effect it increases the cholesterol uh, you know, production into bile acids cholesterol is used to form bile acids under influence of vitamin c vitamin c favors phagocytosis and elevates antibody synthesis so this is how it influences immune system it strengthens immune system in this way uh, it promotes folic acid conversion into tetrahydrofolate tetrahydrofolate is an important substrate involved in mononucleotide synthesis hence dna synthesis so it promotes dna synthesis in this way another function is that it influences iron reduction increases dehydrogenation of nadph it elevates glucose oxidation by pentose phosphate pathway ppp so guys this is the main uh, functions these are the main functions of vitamin c in the question they talked about hydroxylation of an endogenous substances requires a proton donor and our good friend vitamin c any doubt let's go to the next one 20th question is rather simple related to slightly related to pharmacology they say that the formation of a secondary mediator is obligatory in membrane intracellular mechanism of hormone action so we need to point out the substance that is unable to be a secondary mediator let's talk about secondary mediators or secondary messengers the secondary messengers are the molecules that relay signals received on the surface receptors of the cell membrane and they they uh, to the target molecules inside the cytosol or the nucleus so example you are going to a club uh, there is this uh, bouncer at the club's entrance so you go to the club and you show your id to the bouncer and there's some discrepancy so this bouncer sees your id and it he says something on a walkie talkie to someone else now this guy who is inside he goes to the manager or someone else and transfers the information about you to the manager and the manager makes the decision if he wants to let you in or if he wants to kick you out so that person who is inside with the walkie talkie listening to your uh, bouncer is a secondary messenger so secondary messengers are the secondary mes- secondary molecules that relay signals which are received on the receptors by some proteins or hormones growth factors into the target molecules and cytosol 
in the cytosol or the nucleus so we have some uh, classic secondary mediators that we need to remember we can divide them into hydrophobic hydrophilic and gases for a for an easier classification correct so in case of hydrophobic we have these molecules called as diacylglycerol remember dag not just glycerol and also phosphatidyl inositols these are the two hydrophobic secondary messengers in hydrophilic we have cyclic amp cyclic gmp ip3 and calcium ions gases which can act as secondary messengers are nitrous oxide hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide so out of the all the molecules or substances given in the options all can act as secondary messengers except glycerol glycerol cannot act as secondary messenger diacylglycerol which has two fatty acids attached to it can act as a secondary mediator so i think that sums up our video for today we did 10 more questions we're going to pick up the pace in the next few videos try to cover as many questions as soon as we can i'm trying to make these videos as fast or as quickly as i can so if you real if you find this really helpful please drop a comment down below and let me know so that i can understand that my efforts are not being not being in in vain and if you have any suggestion or if you want uh, any like improvements or if you suggest something please drop down a comment and please subscribe to the channel so that this can reach more students and can help others as well so i think that is all for today it's been good see you in the next one